Hello? Am I audible to everyone? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, touch the to all and welcome to the virtual event of Freedom R, an online discussion hosted by Asia Freedom. Uh, touch the to all and welcome to the virtual event. Of Uh, Asia Freedom Institute is a nonprofit organization that promotes uh, democracy and religious freedom in China and Tibet. I'm Sakina. I'm Sakina Bhatt, the moderator for Asia Freedom Institute's Freedom R. And today I am joined by um, Amish Raj Mulmi, the author of um, All Roads Lead North uh, from Kathmandu, Nepal, and Asia Freedom Institute's founder, Kedar Okatsang from Switzerland. Uh, I welcome both of you to the show today. And today we are going to discuss on the book, All Roads Lead North, uh, with the author himself, Amish Raj Mulmi. And uh, the book talks about uh, Nepal's turn to North and its relation with its two giant neighbors, that is India and China. And the book is published by Amazon Context in South Asia and Hearst Publishers in the UK and the US in 2021. And if you need a copy of this book, it is available on Amazon. So um, before we begin with the discussion, let me do the honor of giving a brief introduction to Amish and Kedarla. Uh, Amish Raj Mulni is the author of All Roads Lead North, China, Nepal, and the Context for the Himalayas. His writings have been published in the Himalayan Arc, Journeys East of Southeast, HarperCollins, India, 2018, and Best Asian Speculative Fiction, Kitab, 2018. He has written for, amongst others, Carnegie, Carnegie uh, Endowment for International Peace, Al Jazeera, Roads and Kingdoms, Himal South Asia, India Today, The Kathmandu Post, and The Record. He is consulting editor at Writer's Site Literacy Agency and has previously worked for Juggernaut Books and Hatchet India. So glad to have you here, Amish, and congratulations on your book. Thank you. Thank you, Sakina. Thank you, Kedarla. Pleasure to be here. Uh, Kedar Okatsang is the founding president of Asia Freedom Institute and non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Global China Hub. Uh, Kedar, Kedarla has held various senior leadership positions in the Central Tibetan Administration, including the Washington representative of Washington, D.C. representative for the Dalai Lama, a special advisor to the former president of the Central Tibetan Administration, and the director of CTA Social and Resource Development Fund. He was a candidate in the 2021 Tibetan presidential elections. He has a master's in law and diplomacy from the Fletcher School at Tufts University, Medford, USA, and a bachelor's in English literature from St. Stephen's College, University of Delhi. I would now like to request Kedola to start the discussion. Kedola, over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sakina. And it's great to have you, Amish, with us. Uh, so, this is the first episode of. Uh, uh, our program for this year, 2023. So it's great to have you as our first guest. So welcome. And also I wanted to welcome all of those who are with us uh, online, uh, live, and those who might be watching the video later as well. Uh, so Amish, uh, let me start by, first of all, congratulating you on this uh, excellent, excellent book. And uh, I mean, you've made this very successful transition from being a journalist uh, and a writer to now a successful author with uh, All Roads Lead North being uh, your first book, which came out in uh, mid-2021. Uh, so I was wondering if you could just share with us uh, what has the experience been like? Uh, you know, how difficult or challenging was it to write and research about this book, how long it took? And plus, I mean, you worked on this right in the middle of uh, the pandemic. Uh, so that must have made it uh, doubly challenging. And, uh, you know, the book has 10 chapters. So, you know, which chapters did you enjoy researching the most? Which ones did you find, you know, somewhat challenging? And, uh, and if, you had a, if you had a choice, uh, were there one or two topics which you were really keen to actually address as well? But, uh, you know, for the interest of, I guess, uh, uh, keeping the book focused, you know, you had to leave those out as well. So, so yeah, it's, it's over to you. And again, great to have you with us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kerala. Once again, pleasure to be here. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's, of course, difficult and challenging to write any sort of book, right? But 
uh, with me, especially being my first book, I think the travels to the Himalayan borderlands and just digging out the personal histories, histories, they were challenging, but they were also very, very enjoyable because like travel is always a learning experience, right? So you get out of your comfort zone, you're forced to think beyond your limited understanding of time, of people, history, spaces. So I think that's one particular section that will always be very close to me. I enjoyed writing this entire borderland section, uh, seeing the Himalayan border in real time, how people live, how they interact with both Nepal and China, and this reality of the borders being, border spaces being beyond the popular imagination, like, you know, how you imagine it just as a border crossing and there's just one country ends and the other starts, but, or viewing it from, let's say, the capitalist perspective that it is, okay, a security outpost, you know, that's about it. But to me, when I went to the borderlands, I saw this at this dynamic space, you know, where the residents are turning it into a, the border itself into a resource, despite the state's let's say limitations or challenges that they have faced in real time. So, Sakina, I think I can't hear you. Sorry. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so Amish, I was saying that, you know, like, I have to say that the book is really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. And when I started reading your book, I really... traveled to Tibet for trade, uh, got married to Tibetan women, like lived there for many years at a stretch, and then brought their, uh, their Tibetan wives back to Nepal with them. Amish, as you know that my grandfather is also a Newar, and my grandmother also used to tell me stories about how my grandfather went to Tibet for trade, and how she came back with, uh, with him to Nepal along with all her children. So I could really relate my grandmother's story with the first chapter of the of your book. So your book talks about Nepal's turn to China and its history with China and India. Uh, can you tell us what was it about the Newars that drove you to begin the book uh, with their historical ties with Tibet? I think it's, I would say, if I think about it, it's pretty uh, twofold. So the first is, is Nevada traders, right? And me being a Nevada as well, this, this aspect was very fascinating to me. And I'm sure, uh, so in Nepali literature, there's a lot of uh, proverbs, songs uh, you know, in uh, Nevada's, and there are lots of Nevada songs. And there's a famous poet here called Lakshmi Prasad Dev Koda, whose most famous work is this thing called Muna Madan, which is about a Nevada trader going to uh, Tibet to trade and to earn back money. And it's like Nepal's Romeo and Juliet. So to me, this part, this Nepal, not just Nepal traders, but this entire trans Himalayan trade that Nepal was conducting at a time when, like, I mean, you understand that traders are crossing these difficult borders. They were crossing countries at a time when globalization was not even, you know, like no one had even thought about it, right? But these guys had offices in multiple countries. These guys had their own banking channels. The logistics of you know transport from let's say Calcutta sports all the way to Lhasa it was all set right and that and I found that aspect very very fascinating and the second part about it's we had these close cultural and social connections with Tibet but which have been written about but it's not been extensively let's say discussed not been it's pretty much disappeared from the pub, public let's say history public sphere so i think that part also sort of drove me and the other part is also i mean nepal as a whole has also become more insular right about our cultural and socio-economic connections with the world and about our own history which i mean we barely cross these accepted frontiers of nationalist telling retellings of nepali history but there is so much out there that we've not sort of leveraged even in the modern day. For example, we had trans himalayan traders from Manang who were traveling all the way to Southeast Asia, even before the Second World War. And these are sort of stories that you, you don't hear about. And I think that's one part of both, both these things combined, I think really sort of pushed me to think about this, this part of our, let's say like, I mean, 
this Himalayan history. Now, I wouldn't just call it Nepali history, but like, I mean, because the entire Himalayan belt was this dynamic space, right? So. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Uh, so, yeah, I, too, have uh, a lot of relatives and uh, friends in the Tibetan Newa community, Amish. Uh, so mm -hmm. this was a fascinating chapter. And I think according to your book, uh, uh, by 1959, there were about uh, 1500 uh, of these traders and their family members. Right. And also, I think uh, based on treaties signed between Nepal and Tibet, uh, the Newar traders and the Tibetan children also enjoyed uh, extraterritorial rights. Uh, yeah. So I was wondering if you could just, uh, I know you've already discussed this, but uh, if you could just briefly share some of the key takeaways you know, of this community and its interaction with the host uh, Tibetan community. And I was also wondering uh, to what extent you know, how much of this history and uh, you know, is documented and uh, how much of this information, the story is actually publicly available uh, in Nepal, especially so that mm -hmm. uh, kind of the broader Nepalese you know, population, you know, uh, is aware of it. So in terms of documentation, it's mostly in private hands. So private, uh, so families have been documenting it. Uh, they also have, but there is, uh, I mean, Kamal Ratna Tuladar, who was my uh, copy editor, who is still the copy editor at Kathmandu Post, and he is a one-man archive for his Gorisha trading house. And there has been some academic documentation within Nepal and recently by the scholar called David G. Atwell, but a lot is yet to be done. And at the state level, there is none that I can really recount. And I think, so if you, if you ask me to explain this sort of, trade or rather what uh, Neva's, let's say, connections were with Tibet. So it, it begins from Kathmandu becoming this entreport. Uh, Kathmandu was this entreport sort of like town where goods used to come from the Indian subcontinent or the Indian plains. And then goods used to come from the north, from uh, Tibet, down south. Uh, you had, from Tibet, you had gold, you had salt, you had wool. These uh, borax, that was another major thing. Tea, there was a lot of tea coming down as well. And from the south, you had food grains. Uh, the essence of trans Himalayan trade essentially was a salt for food barter trade across the Himalayan belt, except where it became more developed, where Kathmandu is one place, uh, where it really developed into also serving the demands of, let's say, the Tibetan nobility, the Tibetan aristocratic class, the wealthier classes, who had, let's say, uh, we have documentation of Rolex watches going from here. We have documentation of Parker pens going from uh, mm -hmm. Nepal, uh, from Calcutta all the way. This is once the British opened up the trade route uh, via Sikkim and Nathula. So the traders moved there, uh, essentially making Kathmandu's days as an entrepreneur come to an end. But then, uh, so, and then of course, once uh, the roads start getting made, then, then you see how, infrastructure that also changes the nature of the trade so for example from Kathmandu it, it used to take almost a month a little more than a month to get to Lhasa via Kuti via Nyalam uh, going all through all those routes and from this part you could reach it now uh, I mean once the rail network in India was built up once the roads up to Jalapla and then up to even to Pari were built up uh, you could do the journey, I believe, from Kalimpong in about a week's time. Like uh, by the end, by the 1950s, I'm sure you could do it a little earlier, a little sooner as well. So it's it was a very dynamic space. Like that's that's one of my major contentions as well in the book that this colonial imagination of the Himalaya as this frontier space, right, as this border region, border region to be protected against external aggression. I think that really underplays, downplays and obfuscates as well the dynamism that was evident in the Himalayan region. Like, I mean, you had, it was a constant place of movement where cultures were making, coming together, where people were coming together. Religion was becoming like, you know, like there were exchanges on a massive scale. But these have been relatively, let's say, downplayed in the last, 100 years or 200 years of colonialism in the subcontinent and post-colonial history is obviously now there's a lot more work being done beyond let's say 
just uh, religious connections that used to be emphasized between Tibet and the subcontinent, right? And now there's a lot more work being done around borderlands, around the economics of uh, how this uh, Himalayan communities live. And I think it's an interesting phase to be looking at the mountains in this in this manner, you know, which is, uh, to me, it's a very, very more reflective of what closer to reality, what the reality was. So, so Amish, um, we all know that uh, how China is getting very close to Nepal these days. So uh, can you tell us what are China's interest in Nepal? Uh, so I would argue that you can see China's interests in Nepal along three particular lines, right? Mm -hmm. So the first would be that to ensure that Nepal continues abiding by the one China policy. So in Nepal's context, that means ensuring Tibetan political dissent is stifled, you uh, limit Tibetan border crossing or halt it completely, and no external support is provided to Tibetan exiles inside Nepal. And this also, uh, alongside this, this to also to ensure Nepali support on issues that matter to China in the international sphere. The second interest, broad interest line, I would define it as to curtail American and Indian influence inside Nepal and to ensure Beijing's own political and economic influence can be expanded. So that means, I mean, we've seen it in recent years that recent months that it means to continue opposition to US-led initiatives such as the MCC and the SPP, while ensuring Nepal can be brought under Beijing's initiatives such as BRI, GDI, and GSI. So this, this part also means you expand political ties between the CCP and Nepali communists. And that means that it's also expanding its own political goodwill through aid projects and investments inside Nepal. So this is an extension, I would call it, of its own global interest in reducing American influence. And the third uh, line trajectory of China's interest would be to expand China's economic presence inside Nepal. Mm -hmm. So which means expanding upon the BRI, the modalities are still unclear, but China and Nepal both are keen to expand upon the BRI, which is seeing very little work, but also that means more Chinese investments. And finally, the view that Nepal could be an access to the North Indian market for Chinese products and services, but Although this particular sort of uh, line of thinking looks increasingly difficult now, so. Okay. I think next we had a slide. Uh, let's see. So let me just read this out. Uh, Limi is a place between nations and states, between state and non-state sovereignty, where the border itself is an economic resource, quote unquote. Citizenship in this border zone is a multiple concept. Uh, the locals' allegiances to both the Nepal and the Chinese states, uh, while also uh, possessing a sense of Tibetanness. So it's again, uh, this, uh, Amish, is from your chapter, which you've titled uh, Neither Nepal Nor China, which I've found really, really interesting uh, because it deals with this border area between Nepal and uh, Tibet in the past and now China. Uh, and everything in this area, as you've uh, actually briefly touched on earlier as well, uh, appears really fluid uh, in terms of... Uh, you know, how people in living in these highlands, you know, they have their own laws. Uh, connectivity to the rest of Nepal is extremely limited. Um, and in fact, in some of these areas, uh, it's more accessible from the Tibet side. Uh, there's actually, a, 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 there's a, you mentioned it in your book, you know, in terms of uh, people living in some of these areas in order to get to Kathmandu, first they have to enter Tibet, then India, and then, you know, uh, finally into across uh, the Nepalese border. So given all this, uh, Amish, I was wondering what can the Nepalese government do uh, to better integrate these areas into Nepal? Uh, for instance, you know, during uh, the peak of COVID, it's, it looks like that uh, the locals there uh, found more support from, from the North than from Nepal itself. 
So given the increasing asymmetry in terms of development in these, these uh, very important uh, border areas, do you feel like uh, some of this asymmetry might uh, lead to long-term security challenges for Nepal? Uh, so what's happening in these Himalayan borderlands, even from the Nepali side now, is that they're increasingly being connected by modern infrastructure, right? So you have mobile telephony, you have new roads, and tourism is coming in, migration is happening, and of course, there's the climate change impact. So like, that's yeah. there. Uh, in terms of the asymmetry, see, I would argue that what had happened was that China had invested massively in infrastructure and urbanization in Tibet, right? So the impact of that is being felt on our border areas in the Himalayas. So local communities were increasingly depending on Chinese aid and support because of the road networks, as well as there were new economic opportunities to be found inside China itself, especially in Limi, right? Uh, two particular places, in fact, three particular places I would outline. Uh, the first is Limi, where locals were going across and working in Taklakot or Burang. Uh, uh, they had stores there, they had restaurants there, they were working as laborers. So there were economic opportunities there. The second was in Rasua, uh, across the border with Kirong. It's a town, again, they were working at restaurants, they were working, they had shops, they had um, uh, their own restaurants. So that is another, and Rasua is, as we all know, that's where the famed train from Tibet is supposed to enter, right? And the third is Olangchungola in the further east, where uh, locals were supplying uh, carpets, and there was a homegrown carpet industry that had come up to supply to China, uh, and these opportunities were being created, right, in the borderlands. But this is all a pre-COVID scenario. During COVID, what had actually happened was that because China had closed down the land borders, these connections, these opportunities, and the aid support, food aid support, all of that actually shut down. So I remember local communities in Limi actually made the trek during the last winter, and there were visuals of them crossing snowy passes, asking Kathmandu to supply them with food because they, didn't, they had run out of food. And China had shut down its borders, so food supplies couldn't reach Limi. And this was a similar situation in other border regions as well. So I think that if, if we are thinking about the Nepali states, right, what can the Nepal do to better integrate them? Uh, the first, I would argue, is that there has to be a better political and bureaucratic representation. And I mean in real terms and not just like, let's say nominally, you know, appointing someone for the sake of it, but in terms of actual power being devolved, right? The second is the regions, the borderlands do need greater infrastructure connectivity. I mean, that is an obvious challenge of planning and funds, but this is a necessity, especially today, uh, when you can see the opportunities, the economic opportunities that let's say are, especially in a time where everyone is connected, even in the borderlands, everyone has mobile phones and where 4G networks, even where 4G networks weren't working, such as in Limi, I mean, they were going to Taklakot, they were downloading movies and songs on their phone and playing it back. And so everyone knows everything. Information flow is a lot more freer now, right? And the third, I would argue, is that you need to have greater social inclusion of the borderlands and the people into the, this national narrative. So you you don't have to just highlight the region from the tourism or a national security perspective, but a more holistic one. So to include border residents into decisions regarding development or even border security, uh, like a very interesting example that happened to me, and I've written about this in the book as well, that I, when I was down to Mustang, all the police officers there that I met in Upper Mustang, none of them spoke Tibetan. And when I asked them why they did not hire locals, they said that, oh, these locals will talk in their own language and then we will be left out. And his, the, if whatever the implications you can make of that, the point is that language is an essential part of, let's say, integration, right? But that is itself not happening. So I think that these are things that can be done. There are, like, I mean, we are seeing that Tibetan uh, Himalayan communities now are increasingly becoming dependent on the Chinese side for supplies, for infrastructure, for opportunities. So it, it is easier to access from the Tibetan side. 
Nepal will have to think about how can it integrate these regions better. And I think slowly it, it's taking time, but that thinking has filtered down because we have seen there is, there are, there is, I mean, ideas of let's say north south corridors being banned in humla uh, humla is still unconnected by road and there are similar north south corridors being planned across the region or across the country but i mean it is slow as usual so Amish, uh, you know, and uh, it's quite obvious from your book also that Nepal's relation with Tibet predates the one it has with China. Uh, Nepal has shared historical ties with Tibet in terms of trade and religion, which you have um, so elaborately and so beautifully explained in the first chapter of your book titled um, Traders on the Silk Road. Uh, now we can see, and as we have already discussed, that Nepal is in a very close relation with China. Uh, can you tell us how has uh, the 60 years of Nepal's relation with China affected its relation with Tibet? Can you lead us through the details of the developments over the decades? Okay, so I'll, I'll frame this question in a sort of, uh, it'll be a little bit of a rush through history because 60 years is a long time. So I'll just yeah. some certain themes that I'll uh, so in the beginning and in 1950 and a few years after China came to Tibet, like I mean, China took over Tibet, the Nepali leadership was definitely anxious about China's intentions, right? But Nehru and China's own diplomatic outreach assuaged such concerns, leading to China and Nepal establishing diplomatic ties in about 1955, I think, if I remember correctly. Then with the imposition of the Panchayat rule in 1960, which India opposed. China then turned into a card for Nepali rulers. So then it became to became a political and an economic alternative to India's political and economic influence inside Nepal. So it was seen as this alternative to India, wherever, whenever India relations with India went down, it became a card for Nepali rulers. And then China also expanded on several aid projects inside, inside Nepal. So you had Arnico Highway, you had Prithvi Highway, you had cement factories, shoe factories, and Kathmandu Ring Road, uh, you had the hydropower projects in Pokhara. So these are seen as bolstering Nepal's aspirations and sovereignty because that's what they were addressing. And then alongside this, there was also the Chishigang group uh, presence in Mustang and then American support to these guerrillas made Nepali policymakers very mm -hmm. wary of Tibetan exiles inside Nepal. And then after Nixon and Mao had this rapprochement, the US-China rapprochement in the early late 1960s, early 1970s, CIA ended its support to Tibetan guerrillas, and then Nepal, under a new king, under King Birendra, forced the guerrillas to surrender. But what has happened is that Nepal's view of Tibetan exiles continues to be shaped by this Chushi Gandrug experience and of Western intervention and support to Tibetan political dissent inside Nepal, which was seen primarily during the 2008 anti Beijing Olympic protests. So thereafter, a quid pro quo sort of had developed with China vis-a-vis -vis Tibetan exiles in Nepal. This was the, 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 the template had been set in 2005 itself, when King Ganendra, during the military emergency and during the civil war, he shut down the CTO offices in exchange for military aid from China. So Nepal had continued to view China as this alternative to India, but this was also not possible in the 21st century because of China's own limitations and limited infrastructure inside Tibet. Only when that infrastructure could be properly developed could it emerge as an alternative to India, which is seen finally in the aftermath of the 2015 blockade. So you can actually trace several phases, right? So till about 1959-1962, uh, until the India-China border dispute and war, uh, you had China sort of negotiating its own presence inside Nepal because it was just starting out diplomatic presence uh, till about 19. Uh, nine, till about, I would call it 2006, 2008, it was happy dealing with the king, with the monarchy, which it regarded as a permanent establishment and friendly to China as well. So they were dealing with them. Then once the Republic was created in Nepal and the king was, uh, the monarchy was dissolved, um, China then began to expand, let's say its political presence inside Nepal by reaching out to uh, political parties, especially those from the left, so you can see these phases, you know, where, when China has engaged and then thereafter, like now, of course, like I said, like, I mean, 
with its infrastructure, with its, of course, global power aspirations. And it's, it, it is now, uh, as you know, like asking or rather being seen in, in Nepal as this alternative that it had always been seen to India. So. Right, and also just uh, as a follow-up, uh, a question that relates to the earlier mm -hmm. one. Um, I mean, one of my takeaways from this book, Amish, was that Tibet is presented very much as part of Nepal's past. Uh, and so I wanted to just push you back a little bit on that. <laughs> uh, for instance, if you do a quick search of the book, uh, Tibet is mentioned uh, 920 times. And comparatively, China is uh, mentioned uh, about uh, 1,100 times and India about 650 times. Um, so in many ways, uh, Tibet really is the, the other north, right? In, in the title of your book, All Roads Lead North. So rather than being kind of uh, something that's associated exclusively with Nepal's past, I'm wondering, uh, given you know, how closely uh, or deeply embedded Tibetan um, uh, Nepal Tibet history is, and also uh, how you know Tibet and Tibetan Buddhist culture is uh, part of uh, Nepal's uh, uh, culture and history. Uh, and uh, I'm just wondering, you know, how how easy or difficult would it be for Nepal to really kind of permanently distance itself, uh, both uh, geographically and also uh, untie those deep spiritual and cultural bonds, you know, with the original neighbor up north, which which was Tibet mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. centuries. <laughs> no, I think the. There's, it's, 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 it's quite interesting huh? because the thing is that I, I would say, I would argue otherwise, actually. I would argue that Tibetan culture and religion is embedded in Nepali society, but it's also embedded in a small proportion of Nepali population, which is particular to those living in the Himalayan region and who are ethnically and culturally close to Tibet. And as I explained earlier, like, I mean, this group is already politically and economically marginalized in the larger Nepali society and discourse, right? So that's, I would say that's the first point. And the second point is that within the more politically and economically influential Nepali hill populations, Tibetan Buddhism actually plays a minor role. Uh, it was the Nevar Buddhists who were among the few who were practicing the religion, but that too is a very different or a rather a more indigenous understanding of practice of Buddhism that is not, uh, Yes, of course, that, that respect, that cultural ties. I mean, we had, we had uh, traders who were followers of the Karmapa. Uh, you had uh, a very noted trader. In fact, the uh, Rolex that I was talking about earlier was given to the, uh, was a gift for the Karmapa in about 1940s by a Tuladar uh, trader. So, I, so that's there. But at the same time, I think we also tend to overemphasize on culture and religious ties as being crucial to closer and friendlier ties. I mean, look at Nepal's relations with India, like uh, apart from the, you know, constant, let's say, I mean, there, there is always a sort of a disruption happening one now and then, but, but Nepali policymakers will definitely not sort of define the ties along the same roti beti rishta as Indian leaders like to do. And I think what's, while cultural and religious ties, they are helpful to further dialogue, uh, diplomacy has increasingly become transactional. And socially, like, you know, domestically or internally speaking, Nepal also sees itself as being, whether it's correct or not, it's more, uh, it's, it sees itself as being a unique civilization that is distinct both from Indian as well as Tibetan or Chinese influence. So this view is primarily among the Hill residents, but this is this is the group that de determines or is the primary influence on Nepal's politics, Nepal's outlook of the world, and as I said earlier, Nepal's history as well. So it is a you no, know, it's a difficult. Let's say, I mean, again, like I said, like I, I, my counter is coming from the let's say a more uh, realist sort of a view that yes, of course, the ties cannot be under over overemphasized or they, they, they are like you. It's it's culture and religion will never let's say go away. But 
to argue that because you are culturally and religiously close, that should make for smoother or friendlier ties. I am not so sure. I mean, it is it is a let's say, like I said, Nepal and India. I I mean, they cannot be on India and Pakistan. I mean, the only differing factor is religion, but <laughs> everything else they're pretty alike. So. So, Amish, another really interesting part of the book was the section about um, the Timal village, a sleepy Buddhist village east of Kathmandu, saw this huge de demand on bodhicitta seeds from the Chinese. Uh, the seeds, which were once sold for Nepali rupees uh, 20 per rosary containing um, 108 seeds, uh, spiked to as much as Nepali rupees 6.5 crores per rosary. Uh, this business transformed the entire village financially financially because of the Chinese demand. So uh, tell us about this informal trade in Bodhicitta and Rudraksha seeds, where Chinese are the biggest buyers. And also, can you tell us uh, what are the current prices for the seeds now? So seed prices currently, I am not really aware. But what I'm aware is that they have certainly fallen over the past three years, right? And there are, of course, the pandemic is the primary reason. But also what has happened is that there has been an oversupply and there has also been a Chinese capture of the informal markets where the Chinese basically have started determining prices now. And, of, and because of the pandemic, because of supply concerns, supply chain concerns, prices have reduced for sure. Uh, the other point is that like, I, this is an argument that I generally usually very often make that where you can see the scale of Chinese investment or rather the scale of Chinese economy is really making an impact in Nepal is the informal market in these religious seeds such as Bodhicitta and even Rudraksh and uh, other medicinal herbs like Yalsa Gumba. Uh, if, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, I, I believe Yalsa Gumba uh, medicinal herbs is the third largest category of Nepali exports to China after carpets and handicrafts and Rudraksh seeds are among the top 10 highest exports from Nepal to China. So what happened, what has happened is that since, ever since about like, uh, I would determine about 2008, 2009 as a, as a period when this demand started coming in from Chinese markets and Chinese buyers, they started offering far higher prices than what farmers and collectors were receiving earlier than that. So then entire villages and settlements began to orient themselves in anticipating this Chinese demand and the purchase of such products. So, and as I've written about, we heard sufficient stories about like, you know, everyone I met in Timal was growing bodhicitta and everyone had made, if not lots of money, some decent amount of money and far more than what they were earning from earlier agricultural practices. So, China essentially turned the market into a monopsonistic market where basically the Chinese, there was a single buyer, which is the Chinese market, right? And they started controlling the prices they offered, they controlled the market itself. And then when the pandemic came, prices began to decline heavily. Uh, so then Nepali traders are now earning a lot less than what was expected uh, or what they had earned in earlier years. So currently, because the supply chains have still not been resolved and Chinese uh, nationals have only now been allowed to travel out. It's, I, I would be very interested to see what the situation in, the, in this informal market be, have, becomes this year. I believe uh, the harvest of bodhicitta and the sale, everything happens in around April, May. So let's see how, what 2023 brings to that respect. So. So uh, getting back to Nepal China ties, Amish, uh, the two high points were, you know, Xi Jinping's visit to Kathmandu in uh, 2019. And then two years earlier in 2017, uh, Nepal signed the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, um, BRI. And under the BRI in, uh, agreement, uh, Nepal and China have agreed to work together on nine uh, I think uh, big and medium-sized projects, right? Uh, a lot to do with infrastructure and 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 uh, uh, hydro and uh, so. Uh, I know this is a big topic in terms of uh, infrastructure diplomacy and just everything related related to that. But I think if you could just briefly, Amish, uh, 
tell us about uh, what the expectations were when Xi Jinping made that visit and how much of that expectation, both from the visit as well as uh, from the BRI, how much of that has really materialized? And uh, what tangible benefits have, you know, have accrued to the Nepalese people? Uh, for instance, I know one of uh, Nepal's core aspiration is really the railway line from Kirong to Rasua to Kathmandu, but that looks now more like a, a kind of a distant dream. Uh, so yeah, if you could just really talk about expectations and the actual realities on the ground and just what's happening overall. Uh, so in terms of expectations, I think, and this is this is common to most LDCs, right? This is more common to most LDCs across Asia, Africa. I think everyone wants to replicate the China development story. And in terms of infrastructure push, in, in terms of, let's say, like how they built infrastructure, how they sort of, like, I mean, even in South Asia before COVID, and in fact, uh, I remember in about 2011, 2012, when the, when the Sri Lanka port project actually went ahead and there was a lot of excitement back then as well, even before BRI was over, right? So I think Nepal was expecting similar, let's say, ideas or similar, let's say, pace of development here as well. But what has happened is that on the BRI, there hasn't been much momentum. Uh, the feasibility study on tibet Kathmandu railway line has just begun. I, I think, I believe it's going to take a couple of years more. China has pulled in... China has invested in a couple of infrastructure projects, uh, uh, the Pokhara International Airport, in, for example, uh, which is funded by an Exim Bank loan, China Exim Bank loan, and uh, built by a Chinese construction company. So China had, it's just been inaugurated and China has pulled it under the BRI umbrella, but Nepal has refused to say that it is, the Pokhara Airport is part of BRI. And the other re reality check has also come from the Sri Lankan economic crisis. So Nepal is also wary of increasing external debt uh, resulting from these loans, infrastructure loans in particular. However, I mean, like I said, like, I mean, China's economic engagement has definitely expanded. You have Pokhara International Airport, but you have multiple infrastructure contracts with Chinese companies, either via multilateral institutional loans. Uh, you have several road projects in, under construction by Chinese contractors under ADB loans. Wow. You have a new airport that's come up in Bhairava that is built by a Chinese contractor under an ADB loan. And you also have Nepal's own institutions such as the Nepal Army giving uh, contracts to Chinese companies for road building, things like that. Uh, similarly, in terms of FDI, China's pledges have increased. Uh, it has become the highest pledger, but uh, in terms of commitment, it's still not reached India's level. In sorry, not in terms of commitment, in terms of on-ground investment, it's still yet to reach India's level. Uh, but much of this private investment, whatever has come in from China, has also been in small and medium enterprises. Uh, there are, I would say, in terms of private sector, there are two uh, Hongxi and Huangxi cement plants that, are, that I can recall, and a couple of hydropower projects. There are quite a few investments in hydropower, but increasingly there is also worry now among Nepali players that India has refused to buy power from companies where Chinese companies are involved or invested in. So, but on the larger scale, what we have definitely seen is also an expansion of this political relationship, particularly between CCP and Nepal's communist parties. And China is also therefore more comfortable now voicing its opinion on Nepal's foreign policy choices as seen in its opposition to the MCC and as well as the SPP. So a lot of these, I would say factors have, let's say, uh, these trends can be seen after Xi Jinping's visit particularly and particularly post the pandemic as well, which realigned a lot of these issues as well. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yeah. Awesome. Uh, speaking about BRI, Amish, uh, we are all aware of the economic crisis uh, that happened in Sri Lanka. And uh, Nepal has always been very clear about uh, accepting only grants and not loans from China, fearing that they may also slip into this uh, debt trap like that of Sri Lanka. So are there any similar fears in Nepal about uh, debt trap diplomacy? Uh, so while I won't argue that <laughs> like, I mean, the Sri Lankan crisis was the result of an intentional debt trap diplomacy practice. Uh, what is definitely true is that many of the Sri Lankan economies' foundational weaknesses are very similar to Nepal's. 
So, for example, the over-reliance on a few sectors uh, for foreign exchange earnings. Um, you had uh, tourism and tea there in Sri Lanka. Here you have remittances and tourism. Uh, and what we also see is that, sorry, what we also see is that political interests are driving non-transparent mega infrastructure projects that have not been weighed for profitability or business operations. And that is increasingly, I mean, particularly because of the Bhairava Airport, which is where in, in national airlines are refusing to fly out of uh, the experience of that, as well as the experience of Sri Lanka as well. Nepali policymakers have become very wary of a similar situation occurring in Nepal. Uh, I could argue that this also stems as much from the fear of the popular revolt in Sri Lanka subsequent to the crisis as from this economic scenario. But I think, I think we may see Nepal refusing bilateral projects you know, especially those funded by loans where interest rates are higher than normal. Uh, it will definitely ask for more grants from here on, even for infrastructure projects. Mm, but like I said, like, I mean, political interests are driving much of the discourse, both around foreign policy as well as these economic policies. So this could change depending on how the political dispensation of the day, let's say, designs its policies. Right. Uh, so uh, I want to pull up another slide uh, to help kind of uh, facilitate a conversation. So this data, it really reflects the inherent asymmetric nature of the relationship, right? And these are fiscal year 20, 2020, 21 numbers. I've also seen the 21, 22 numbers, but uh, uh, I was a little bit wary of uh, putting them up because I wasn't sure if, how official they were, but the numbers were actually, the disparity has actually increased uh, since the last fiscal year. But just for the fiscal year 2020-21, Nepal's total import uh, from China equaled around 234 billion Nepalese rupees, whereas the exports were just uh, 1 billion rupees. So the, the question really is, Amish, uh, how does Nepal handle this kind of a growing inequality uh, in its bilateral relationship and avoid this unsustainable level of uh, economic dependency uh, with China, yeah, or on China rather, yeah. Mm, I would say, I mean, Nepal, I, with most of our major trading partners, I would argue that we would have a trade deficit. And that's because we are a net importer and we have very little manufacturing or export oriented services sector. So Nepal's trade balance, I doubt with most economies will not be in its favor, whether it's India, whether it's China, we are the two biggest trading partners or even let's say US. And I think the key challenge for Nepali exports is the same across economic geographies and in the global South and not just with its neighbors. The key will be like, uh, we, so there are lots of non-tariff barriers, for example, like I mean, labeling of our products, you know, certifying, making sure that our products are internationally certified. You know, they meet the international standards. We do we, we face our products face face such non-tariff barriers. You also have a poor regulatory framework that they do not make our exports competitive. Uh, for example, I mean. We've been talking a lot about agriculture exports, agriculture product produce exports from Nepal, uh, but we don't have a proper quarantine center. We don't have a proper biological certification lab. So without those, and like I said, like, I mean, you need that quality certification, especially in things like, but because the potential is there, especially like, uh, and again, this is a story from Nimi and I cannot uh, confirm whether economically or rather in real time, it can, it can be uh, done, but what he told me was, one of uh, Limi local told me was that they grow potatoes in Humla, they grow, uh, they grow apples, they grow ap apricot. And because of the lack of road access, a lot of these materials by the time they reach Kathmandu, even inevitably get spoiled because of course they are very short uh, window without again, coal chain facilities, right? Coal chain supply chain facilities, but with the proper labs, with the proper, let's say, like labeling, things like that, you Nepal can easily, you know, the Limi locals could have easily sold the produce across in Taklakut, where there is a demand, 
where potatoes are coming in all the way from Xinjiang. So I, I suppose, I mean, these cross culture, you know, little, little things can be uh, the potential for a larger agriculture market, export market is there. But like I said, like, I mean, unless Nepal changes its economic framework, its outlook, <clears throat> such we will continue to face such overwhelming <clears throat> trade imbalance. So. Mm -hmm. So um, your book describes in detail how China's financial assistance has enhanced uh, the living standards of the local Nepali people, uh, be it the Lemi people being allowed to work in Burang across the border or the entire village in Timal, as we have discussed, benefiting of the Chinese influence or the influx of uh, Chinese tourists in Tamil, uh, which is where I live and is also uh, one of the tourist hub in Kathmandu. Uh, but again, uh, Amish, in your conversation with Sandai, a restorator in Tamil, uh, even though he has acquired Chinese language skills or he has learned to cook Chinese cuisines, uh, he has mentioned that the Nepali landlords in Tamil, because the Chinese uh, people have started to come to Tamil to do their own business. Uh, the Nepali landlords in Tamil, they prefer to have uh, Chinese as their tenants because they are paying the Nepali landlords double the amount as compared to a Nepali. So do you foresee Chinese investment into the local markets as posing potential risk uh, to Nepali business owners? Mm, of course. I mean, Chinese like the scale of Chinese investment, even at the smaller scale before, as was seen before the pandemic, I mean, it's more than enough to, adequate, to overwhelm local Nepali entrepreneurs. Uh, the rents in Tamil are one example, but that's the same across sectors. No? Like, I mean, Chinese business owners can may pay more to landlords and suppliers. They can service across borders. They can profit from exports and access. I mean, local Nepali entrepreneurs barely have and this capture of the informal, the seed market that I was talking about is another example. I mean, the one of the key challenges for, uh, this is tying up to the earlier question, is that, especially for most LDCs, is that we have very little value addition in our exports as well. And the Chinese have successfully done it with the seed market that we have not been able to do. Uh, but this is a risk all smaller economies face in the age of globalization. Like I said, like, I mean, the key is you have to ensure a regulatory framework where local companies and entrepreneurs can compete with foreign companies on a level playing field. You can't like, I mean, this, the, the like small businesses definitely will get overwhelmed, especially, I mean, you, you already see, I mean, you were seeing before the pandemic that Nepali tourism itself was increasingly being oriented towards the Chinese group tourist. Um, you saw, uh, I remember someone telling me before the pandemic that a seven day, a seven night, eight day trip to Nepal, including let's say air tickets inside Nepal, was costing them around twenty eight thousand NC, which is about. Uh, about $280 in current prices. So those rates that, let's say, are being offered to Chinese uh, tourists, uh, that impact, that knock-on effect will be on the entire tourism economy, no? So... Right. Uh, so I had a related question. Uh, your book mentions this very interesting, but also somewhat, uh, I guess... Uh, worrying development where what we're seeing is uh, the creation of an entire retail and service ecosystem catering almost exclusively to the Chinese clientele. Uh, and a case in point is the, the Shinzi you know, bookstore in Kathmandu. So my understanding of this, Amish, is that when you enter into this kind of a commercial enterprise, every aspect of the transaction with the client is done uh, in Chinese, you know, in terms of the presentation, in terms of the, the marketing, the, the sales. And also I've heard that the, uh, the actual payment, the payment transaction is, all, is also done in a way which bypasses the whole Nepalese financial network. 
So I'm just wondering in that kind of uh, development, which is being funded mostly by uh, Chinese investment, and in uh, and I think in, in a lot of these cases also being operated by uh, Chinese uh, entrepreneurs. How does this kind of a business uh, benefit the local Nepalese economy and the government? And and just uh, can you just maybe uh, just share more about just uh, you know. Uh, developments on this front? Well, see, I want to break this in two parts, right? Like, I mean, the first part is that there is an obvious shortage of capital in the Nepali economy, and which is why, like, I mean, we've been, we've seen foreign investment as this sort of panacea for a lot of Nepal's, let's say, economic woes. And so at one scale, of course, especially in like larger when larger investments come in, such as in hydropower, right, uh, you can see tangible benefits in terms of employment, in terms of supply contracts, in terms of local tenders. So there is this knock-on effect happening in the local, in the national uh, economy as well as local economies. But like I said, like I mean that that large-scale Chinese investment with the potential to transform Nepali economy is yet to arrive. So what we currently have are Chinese small and medium and enterprises and whose primary goal, like you said, is basically orienting themselves to Chinese tourists and expats and not the local market. And so that is an obvious, like I said, like, I mean, before the pandemic, like they were using these digital payment systems such as Alipay, WeChat, without these transactions entering the Nepali financial system. So and there was an obvious loss to the exchequer. The Nepali government then actually cracked down and uh, sort of now both Alipay and WeChat have come in uh, with her joint, with a partnership with, with Nepali banks. So the money will now enter the Nepali financial system. But for that, Chinese stories have to obviously come back. So again, like I said, like, I mean, you had multiple of these cases, right? Like uh, you had the Chinese tourism economy, like the Nepali tourism economy that is reorienting itself to the Chinese consumer, you had Chinese, let's say, services coming up to service Chinese tourism, but Chinese tourists themselves were not coming for the past three years. Now that they've opened up, let's see, I mean, Nepali tourism market has rebounded, uh, I wouldn't say to pre-pandemic levels, but this year in 2022, we saw about 650,000 tourists. Let's see, I mean, what happens from here on, but this is a concern that is increasingly being felt at least among local entrepreneurs. And my sense is that it is also to do with, uh, like with most markets, right? Like, I mean, an equilibrium will probably be found eventually, but for that to happen, whether I, for the past three years, most Chinese restaurants, and Sakina will probably actually agree to that as well, that most Chinese restaurants, most Chinese hotels, cargo companies, almost all of them have been shut down in Tamil. So let's see whether they reopen. If they are not reopening, then what, what else? I mean, landlords will have no choice but to give it to back to the Nepali uh, entrepreneur at the lower rates, rent rates, than what the Chinese are offering. No? No. Right, right. Okay, so we shall do one last question. And I would like to ask Adola to ask a last question for this um, panel. So thank you again, Amish. Uh, this has been a really fascinating uh, conversation. And uh, so um, let me just end by asking you, uh, taking you back to the political situation in Nepal. So we have a new prime minister uh, who has been elected for the third time uh, for the prime minister's office. And we also have another coalition government. Uh, it's also a minority government because the party which the the Congress party, which won the, the largest number of votes, uh, they are sitting out this time. So all this uh, does not seem to bode very well for continued you know, stability. But I was just wondering, I mean, if you can just uh, wrap things up by uh, just sharing your views on where you see things uh, politically and especially in terms of uh, Nepal's foreign policy, like uh, which direction do you think it's going and how does Nepal continue to maintain this delicate balance between uh, India and China. And of course, we also have a third power now in the United States as well. So just allow for the new Nepalese government to, to take on and to really consider. So, so your take on just where things are. So it's interesting, right? Like, I mean, uh, 
the 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 uh, unpredictability of nepali politics can be just explained by the fact that this largest party that you just mentioned uh, it actually supported prachander's coalition government so now they have uh, 268 out of 270 mps voted for this government it doesn't we don't have a current we don't have an opposition currently so that is the scene domestically right uh and then so it was a foreign policy at least my sense is that we 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 say that we supposed to be non aligned and but what is increasingly clear is that nepali foreign policy is being motivated by personal interest uh, there's no continuity in ties with our neighbors which bounces from one side to another depending on who is in power and that's how policies are being like our foreign policy is simply there is no continuity that you see there's no continuity in a domestic policy making either so foreign policy is a different thing uh, it's what, what has happened is that nepali foreign policy i mean goals the outlook has also been undermined by the political classes petty interests of these retaining power like i just told you i mean we don't have an opposition so what else can you say right uh we are not we are also not adapting our foreign policy to the demands of the modern day so our diplomacy barely features any economic agendas and we don't incorporate this massive nepali diaspora population that we have within our foreign policy discourse and like i said the sole factor that's driving nepali foreign policy is which leader is in power so going ahead my sense is just again like i mean we will perhaps see connectivity projects with india expand and that will certainly that is even now it is happening and we will also see progress on the mcc and perhaps also increasing let's say aid commitments from the us government to nepal and we will also see expanding engagement with china uh, what nepal is actually hoping is that it can make do by not aligning with any great power and engaging with all but also increasingly it is likely that smaller countries like nepal will have to make tough choices in the years to come and these will be choices that may determine i mean how nepali society also sees itself in the future whether the current political leadership has the capability to maneuver nepal through this stormy period of international affairs it remains to be seen i mean i certainly hope they do <laughs> so Okay, thank you so much, uh, Amish, for this very productive uh, discussion. As much as I enjoyed reading this book, I absolutely enjoyed today's discussion as well. Uh, there was so much to learn from this book, and I mostly enjoyed reading every aspects of Tibet's history, uh, Tibet's historical ties with Nepal. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Amish, for this uh, wonderful book. And to our viewers, if you want to get a hold of this book, it is available on Amazon. And Amish, it was really nice to have you uh, have you join us. today and uh, i know that you don't work on the weekends and yet you were so kind to give us your time <laughs> thank you amish and thank you kedolla i would also thank like you. to thank yep. everyone thank who was involved for today's discussion handling all the technical aspects of today's discussion in the background and to our lovely live audience for being a part of today's event it was so nice having you all here and and um and The video of this session uh, will be uploaded on AFI website at uh, www.asiafreedominstitute.org and please follow Asia Freedom Institute's Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn pages for more information on uh, AFI programs and activities. Thank you so much everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.